I am Clifford Singer. I'm a former director of ACTUS, the University of Illinois program on arms control and domestic and international security. Before introducing the speaker for the second annual Jeremiah Sullivan Memorial Lecture, I will summarize a eulogy to Professor Sullivan by his longtime colleague, Fred Lamb. Professor Sullivan's significant contribution to particle physics earned him an international reputation and led to his selection for influential positions. Those included membership on the U.S. Department of Energy's High Energy Physics Advisory Board and acting head of the Theoretical Physics Division at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in 1972. In the mid-1970s, Jeremiah became increasingly interested in national and international security questions, and these gradually became the main focus of his career. In 1974, he accepted an invitation to become a member of JSON, <coughs> a group of experts who provide technical analysis to the U.S. government on scientific issues relevant to national security. Jeremiah was particularly interested in civilian and military uses of space, safe and secure dismantlement of nuclear weapons, and disposition of fissile materials. Technologies for enhancing the effectiveness of peace operations, arms control verification, and science and public policy. In 1986, Jeremiah became director of ACTUS. During the next eight years, he helped expand the education and outreach aspects of the program and helped to support the creation of the War and History program and courses on topics related to national and international security. Encouraged by Fred Lamb's pioneering work, Jeremiah played a leading role in the 1995 Department of Energy-sponsored study that led to the United States signing the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in 1996. Jeremiah served on many U.S. government agency and laboratory advisory and review committees. Those included National <coughs> Nuclear Security Administration, and Sandia, Livermore, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratories. During four years, he was U.S. Representative to the NATO Science Committee's Panel on Security-Related Civil Science and Technology. Jeremiah also gave his time and advice to many non-governmental organizations. These included the Committee on International Security and Arms Control of the National Academy of Sciences, the Committee on National Security and Arms Control of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Physical Society's Panel on Public Affairs, and the Board of Directors of the Arms Control Association. He served on the American Physical Society's 1985-87 study panel on directed energy weapons. Jeremiah received an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship, <coughs> a research fellowship for his work in high energy physics, and was elected to the fellowship in the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In the year 2000, the American Physical Society gave him its Leo Szilard Award, quote, for leadership in addressing technically complex and often controversial national security interest issues, such as anti-ballistic missiles, stockpiled stewardship, and a comprehensive test ban. He was honored for setting a high standard for applying the rigorous methods of physics to the challenging problems of integrating advanced technology with sound so policy in a democratic society. Jeremiah was unfailingly courteous, kind, and humane, and was treasured by his friends and colleagues for his honesty, fairness, open-mindedness, and humanity. It is thus fitting that an annual lecture series to honor Professor Sullivan was launched in 2017. Our speaker, John Lynn, joined the Department of History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1978. During 1994-95, he was Oppenheimer Professor of Warfighting Strategy at the Marine Corps University at Marine Corps Base Quantico in Virginia. He served as President of the United States Commission on Military History from 2003 to 2007 and Vice President of the Society for Military History. He has been awarded two foreign decorations the French Order de Palme Académique at the rank of Chevalier and the Moroccan Order of Wissam al in the rank of Commander. In 2017, he received the Sam Elliott Morrison Prize from the Society for Military History. This award is given in recognition of career accomplishments and contributions. It is the highest award granted by the Society. 
in August of 2017, Lynn was awarded a national <coughs> an NEH Public Scholar Grant to fund research and writing on his current project, A History of Surrender. He is the author of Another Kind of War, An Introduction to the History of Terrorism, Women, Armies, and Warfare in Early Modern Europe, Battle, A History of Combat and Culture. He also ordered, authored three books covering French military history in the 17th and 18th century. He brings to the study of what is commonly called terrorism a special perspective and rarely heard insights to be shared with us in this, the second annual Jeremiah Sullivan Memorial Lecture. Greetings. My name is John Lynn, and I'm a historian at the University of Illinois, and it is my honor to give the second annual Jeremiah Sullivan Memorial Lecture. Now, we first gave this lecture back on May 1st, 2019, but the filming of the lecture didn't quite work out well, and I suggested that I redo the lecture, reprise the lecture, uh, in a studio environment so that it would be more accessible to people. And that's what we're doing here. Now, that's Jeremiah Sullivan. Jeremiah Sullivan, to me, is one of the finest intellectuals and people I've ever worked with at the University of Illinois. He was a star physicist. He was the chair of the Department of Physics at the University of Illinois. He also was a great leader in a couple of ways. When he was heading ACTUS, Arms Control, Disarmament, International Security, same letters nowadays, we change the words a little bit, but it's the same group. When he was the head of that, he had a way of getting excited about what everybody in ACTUS was doing, including me. I'm an historian. He's a physicist. I really can't say I really understood all the work he was doing. Uh, but he sure understood mine, and he got excited about it and supported me and others when we needed it. So thank you very much, Jeremiah. And there's another thing about his leadership. At a certain point, he decided that he needed to take advantage of his tremendous academic and scholarly learning and apply it to public policy, to do something that mattered in a broader context. Well, I like to think that I'm following that leadership as well. Most of my military story, history over the period, ages uh, uh, dealt with really remote periods, you know, 17th and 18th century, that sort of thing. But when 9-11 struck, I thought, wait a minute. I've developed an expertise in military history over the years. What in that body of knowledge and sensitivity and maybe even a little wisdom could I use to help us understand and deal with terrorism better? And so in 2003, I began to teach a course on the history of terrorism. I've done it to this very day, a few years at Northwestern, back in Illinois and even now online. And in a sense, that is following his lead once again. So once again, thank you, Jeremiah. Now, let's begin talking about terrorism. And we're going to use a famous quote to begin with. Raymond Aron was a, a scholar, French scholar, very noted, who wrote about philosophy of war, that sort of thing, in addition to other things. And his statement was, an action of violence is labeled terrorist when its psychological effects are out of proportion to its purely physical results. In other words, he was saying that terrorism is a form of psychological warfare. Now, I put it this way. Terrorists Terrorism is about violence and the threat of violence. In order to achieve a psychological impact, 
And that impact will then result in a political effect that the terrorists want to happen, okay? In psychological warfare, what they're basically doing is they're weaponizing our own emotions. They're using our own fear, our own outrage at their acts in order to get us to do what they want us to do. And to be very simple, what I'm saying is we can't stop the violence. I mean, we, I hope that, that we can limit the violence, but the, the very nature of the violence is it's going to happen. But we can short circuit its impact at the psychological level, at the level of understanding, by knowing about it, by studying it, by asking the right questions, and not simply reacting in the way the terrorists want us to re react. In short, I argue Terrorism is a form of psychological assault or warfare that weaponizes the emotions, most notably fear and outrage. By the way, when you look at people talking about like the history of emotions, which is a big deal right now, what's the first two emotions they always mention? Fear and anger. By the way, Aristotle does that too. Fear and anger. Well, anger is another word for outrage. Okay? And I argue that knowledge and understanding are among our best means to defeat terrorism, to defeat terrorism as this form of psychological warfare. Now, every time you talk about terrorism, you've got to state your definitions and your approaches because People come at it from all kinds of different directions, okay? Now, I don't have time to develop them all right. I don't have the time here to nuance them at all. But I'm going to have to state them. And I'm going to do it in the quickest way possible, and that's by reading them, okay? Terrible thing to do in this kind of a situation. But I'm going to do it. First of all, terrorism is violence and the threat of violence against those unable or unprepared to defend themselves. This is often shorthanded to being an attack on civilians, but it's not always civilians. Um, others talk about non-combatants, people who aren't, you know, you could be wearing a uniform but not in the fight and be attacked by a terrorist, okay? It is also key that ter in terrorism, the threat ultimately matters more than the actual violence. The violence is a kind of propaganda. In fact, terrorists talk about the propaganda of the deed all the time, that the best way to affect opinion is by an act, not simply by words. Terrorism operates by inciting moral outrage and spreading a sense of vulner vulnerability through a large target population, or we would call it an audience, a popular audience. Because terrorism is political theory, political theory, political theater, okay? A political theater. And on the stage, you play to an audience. Thing about terrorism, they're usually playing to several audiences. Audiences of supporters and audiences of people they regard as the enemy, the foe that they're trying to influence. Now, in order to draw important distinctions, we need to recognize a broad range of terrorism from that perpetrated by very strong entities like states, military forces, and dominant social groups, down to that committed by relatively weak sub-state groups and even by lone individuals, those lone wolves, okay? I label this lower level as weak capacity terrorism, and I call it radical terrorism. It's what's going to mainly concern this lecture today, okay? And I, again, will develop in that area. When I say just terrorism, I'm really going to be talking about radical terrorism. But let's digress just for a second. I want you to look at this, okay? This is my typology of terrorism. I think it's really important 
to have a very broad range of terrorism that you're looking at, okay? I think you have to look at state terrorism and that by military forces at war and that by dominant social groups in order to recognize differences and, and, and comparisons. Frankly, when you just use the terrorism, we don't break it down, I think we end up comparing apples and oranges, okay? Now, at the bottom of that descending list of capacity or power, I put radical terrorism by sub-state groups, okay, and then radical terrorism by individuals. Of course, I would argue, we talk about individuals and wolf, lone wolves. To me, a lone wolf always implies there's a pack somewhere. In other words, they see themselves as representing a, a, something larger than the, just their own, own uh, proclivities, okay? Ah, but that does not end the fundamental statements we have to make here, okay? Weak radical terrorist groups often have more to gain by inciting outrage than by inflicting fear. Everybody talks about fear, but in fact, a terrorist group, a weak terrorist, can gain much more leverage by outrage. Why? Because outrage causes people to react in ways that will help the terrorists. They'll say things that, that are foolish or wrong. They will do things that are overreactions. And ultimately, they will harm themselves by their reaction. I also argue that radical terrorism is a form of warfare. A violent means by which the powerless hope to achieve political power. In fact, I often call it entry-level warfare. It's the lowest level on which you can bring violence in as part of, the, of your political dialogue. Okay? For me, radical ter terrorism emerged as a form of violent political resistance in the middle of the 19th century. And since then, it has served many masters, many purposes. It belongs to no one nation, ethnicity, ideology, or religion. Since it emerged, I argue it's really kind of had three waves of terror. The first begins around the 1850s through about 1920. The second begins really after World War II, or right in the late stages of World War II. And it was more ethno-nationalist and Marxist in its orientation. And then around 1980, 1980 with the, with the Iranian Revolution and with the, the uh, Soviet-Afghan um, War, and I think also with, with the, the Israeli in, invasion, of Lebanon, we see radical Islam as the major form of terrorism. Now you notice I it's the beginnings because things kind of drag on and overlap at times. Well, I could give you ethno-nationalist terrorist groups like, like even the IRA and the Tamil Tigers operating after 1980, but the point is that's when the third wave gets going. Now, I don't have the time to discuss all of this today, and frankly, it would take a book to do so. But luckily, I've written the book, okay? And what, everything I'm saying really relates to, to what's in the, in the book. So I'm not making things up along the way. But we're going to talk about strategies, which is just one of the things we deal with in the book. Okay? Now, let's go to the next slide, and I'm going to argue certain things here. The terrorists see themselves, and here we're talking about radical terrorists. They see themselves as fighting for a great cause, something's essential, something that's just, something that can only be advanced through violence. The implication that we tried other things or other things are simply impossible, or the only thing that's gonna work is violence, okay? That they are 
surprisingly normal. I, I know it's very tempting to say people who do those awful things must be crazy, and, and you get that out of someone. No, the best works on the psychology of terrorism absolutely agree they're normal. In other words, they're not psychotic or sociopaths any more than the general population is. But what they do do is they live, I would argue, in a separate moral universe of extremes in which the things they're fighting for are so important they're worth advancing by any means necessary. They're a classic example of the means, uh, excuse me, of the ends justifying the means, okay? And the more limited they are by their own weakness in numbers and resources, the more limited they are, the more limited their choices, the more they have to engage in things that are morally outrageous. And they believe they have to. They believe they are compelled to act that way, both by the greatness of their cause and the weakness of their uh, own groups or individuals. And I'm going to say lastly, they are rational actors. Now, I don't mean reasonable, okay? Those are two different things. Rational actors decide on tactics and strategy. They carry things out. They see how, what works and what doesn't. They make adjustments. They make rational choices, okay? Now, as rational actors, they are then going to pursue different strategies, different rational strategies. And so we've got to look at this for a minute. There's a lot of confusion about the way people use terms, strategy and tactics and things like that, when they're not really military, you know, in their orientation, okay? Um, I, I am a military historian, so I want to get this stuff straight. First of all, we need to talk about the goals of wars, okay? That there are purposes to their, their wars. Now, the strategies are, in the big picture, how do you conduct a war to, to achieve those goals? Those are the strategies, those are the big questions. Tactics are the way you use violence in particular struggles. Am I going to use a car bomb? Am I going to use a suicide bomber? Am I going to, you know, shoot up a... a a marketplace, what have you. What are, my, what are my tactics? And a subdivision of that is stratagems. And stratagems are really tactics of deceiving and outwitting the enemy. And terrorists are very good at that. Terrorists are doing things to get you to do what they want you to do. And those are stratagems, stratagems okay? So let's go on to the next thing. Now, what I've just put on the screen is my diagram of the four strategies of terrorism. And actually, I just stated it wrongly. I said the four. And really, it's simply four. Could there be five? Could there be six? Yeah, sure. I mean, my attitude is I want to draw differences. I want to emphasize contrast but at the same time, I'm fully aware that things in reality get, get much, what would I say, much more complicated. But what you see there is intimidation, initiation, attrition, and evolution. Now, there's another thing to notice on that diagram. I separate with that dotted line between strong terrorist groups and weak capacity groups. My sub-state radical terrorists. Because I think there's a real difference in strategy. Okay? And the strategy of initiation is something that a weak group would use, but the strong group wouldn't. The strong war is going to emphasize intimidation. Why? It's not trying 
to create resistance, it's trying to dominate it. Now let's look at intimidation as a strategy. Primarily, again, it is a strong capacity terrorist technique, and it emphasizes fear. Fear because what the strong terrorist, the state, the military, the dominant social group, it is trying to enforce acquiescence, obedience, subjugation. It wants to end resistance. It has no use for inciting reprisals. It has no use trying to get you to do something active. The intimidation is to, to get you to submit, okay? Now, intimidation is also useful to weak groups. And when we look at that, that formulation again, you're going to see there's two lines up the uh, top the, the, of, of intimidation. They also go with the weak groups. What are they going to need it for? Well, yes, they use fear of the, in, the, in, the, in the target uh, community, uh, fear and outrage, but they use fear, so intimidation's there. Also, these sub-state groups need, need ways of enforcing discipline within their own communities and within their own groups. And fear works that way, okay? Fear, say for example, will, would keep somebody loyal, keep them, make them keep their mouths shut about secret information, okay? Also, there's another thing. Often, the substrate group isn't the only one that's opposing a common enemy. And they resent or they can resent com competition, rivals. Perfect example is during the Algerian War of Independence. The FLN, which was the dominant group, did terrible things to other Algerian groups, which were also working for, for independence, but not obeying the FLN. So in fact, there, there is this use for it. However, again, we'll go, I'll go back, notice, I've got the the use of intimidation going across, yes, the weak too, in those senses I've just mentioned. But they have special strategies that allow them to operate even when they are weak. And initiation is the most tempting and the most frustrating of those. What is initiation? Well, initiation is the radical terrorists seeing themselves as a precipitant or a catalyst for something much bigger. They're going to get the whole population to join in the resistance to this corrupt, awful regime they're trying to overthrow, okay? But they don't necessarily think they're going to run the whole show. All they need to do is get it going, okay? Like a catalyst makes a chemical reaction happen. And initiation benefits a great deal by exploiting outrage, okay? So they want to do things that'll get a government to overreact, to demonstrate that it's wicked, or that it's weak, that, that it reacts, but it doesn't stop the terrorists, okay? And I use that, that thing about the wickedness and the weakness of government, uh, of oppressors, I guess we could say, okay? Initiation appeals to very weak groups. A few people, you know, a handful, a score, maybe a couple hundred, a relatively small group, conscious of its own weakness, but believing that there is a great frustration, a great resistance, and it just needs to get going. And they're going to help it get going. They're going to reveal things about the government's inability to, to stop violence. So join, join the resistance, join the following. Now, that has the 
possibility of attracting groups that are only talking to each other. They're convinced that they're absolutely right. They're convinced that the regime or whatever they're trying to overthrow is bad. And that a lot of people agree with him, but just haven't come out yet. And yet, they're often wrong. When, when people comment, and I've had these comments that, that are from people saying, well, you know, terrorists always fail. Well, they don't always fail, but they, but they, but they often fail, and they often fail precisely in that notion that with just a few people and just a, a, a limited amount of action, they can get something huge going. Initiation is tempting, but it can also be a, a what would I say, a temptation to disaster. Then there's attrition. Now, for attrition to work, I think a terrorist group has to be a bit larger. It has to be large enough to put a strain on the resources of the oppressor, okay? It doesn't have to be large enough to defeat them. It has to be large enough to wear them down. And here, it's not, we're going to do something and then a big thing's going to result. We're going to engage the enemy over time and cause enough loss to that enemy that the enemy will come to see it isn't worth it to maintain itself in that situation, okay? Perfect example of attrition is the provisional IRA. They start out, I, I would argue 1970, they really split off late 69, 70 from the old IRA. They start off with the notion that they're going to make it happen right away, okay? And they maintain that notion all through 71, 72. 72, of course, is Bloody Sunday, which worked very much to the advantage uh, of the terrorists, to tell you the truth, because lots of people join because they're so outraged by Bloody Sunday. They negotiate with the British in London, secret negotiations, but they insist that the, the, they don't even negotiate until the British say they're going to leave Northern Ireland, and that doesn't work. Then they come back, and in July of 1972, they run the biggest operation they ever ran in Northern Ireland. It's called Bloody Friday. There's about 20 bombs that go off in Belfast. People talked about Belfast looking like it was under an artillery barrage, okay? But all that does is get the British to intervene even more. By the middle of the 70s, they see it isn't going to happen big, but they don't want to aban uh, abandon the cause. And they've got more members. And in 76, 77, they change their policy and they call, start talking about the long war. And the long war is specifically a war to wear down the British, to focus as much as possible on the British Army, but they'll attack civilians too. But the bit is to wear the British down to the point where they say staying in Northern Ireland isn't worth it. Okay, that's attrition. And you could argue the FLA... Uh, the, the FLN, excuse me, does that to the French in, in Algeria, too. There's other cases of it. But you've got to have a certain amount of power to be able to do that, where you could be a tiny cell and, and imagine yourself as being able to use initiation. And then there's evolution. Evolution is the notion we're going to start small, and then we're going to get bigger and bigger over time. We are going to begin as terrorists. As we grow in strength, we could then mount a real insurgency, which implies more people, more resources, a little more, more control. And eventually, we could meet the enemy on their own terms. Okay? One of the things that came to me in looking at terrorism, based on earlier work I'd done back in the 90s on um, insurgency and on theories of insurgency was Mao's theory of evolving warfare in terms of insurgency, okay? And we'll talk about that uh, in a minute here. So let's talk about examples, just, just examples of, of evolution. What you're seeing on the board are what I consider to be some pretty good examples of evolution. 
the FLN in Algeria, although that's complicated because it was fighting different, different wars in different parts of Algeria and in France, sometimes as terrorists, sometimes as insurgents, whatever. The FARC in Colombia, think about it. That literally starts out as a handful of people. It grows. It carries on a, a, a path of violence that leads to insurgency that lasts for 50 years. Okay, And it finally, a couple of years ago, finally we reached a peace settlement with the Colombian government and it became a political party. Okay, The Tamil Tigers of Sri Lanka, they, again, start as, as a very small group. They make war on other Tamil resistance groups to get larger, kind of, you know, feeding on their friends, and, and then end up controlling much of Sri Lanka until they're defeated. The Hezbollah in, in uh, Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza. I mean, uh, the, the Hamas controls Gaza so much that, that Netanyahu, Netanyahu it re refers to Gaza as Hamastan, like Afghanistan. Okay? It is the land of Hamas. But the biggest example is the Islamic State. Think of it. It starts with the Zarqawi with a small group, we call it the, the JTJ, I, I could manage the Arabic for it. And then it evolves into Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI. Then after Zarqawi's death, it becomes the Islamic State of Iraq, which is eventually headed by al-Baghdadi, who then sees the opportunity in Syria and it becomes ISIS, active in both Iraq and Syria. And then in June of 2014, with its offensive, it becomes the Islamic State. It controls such territory. It controls cities. One of the basic things about, about that highest level of warfare is you can take and hold areas against a strong enemy. You can take Mosul, okay, for example, as they did. So, there are my four, four strategies, okay? Intimidation, initiation, attrition, and finally, evolution. I'm not saying that every group starts at one and moves on to the other. I, there's also a very interesting question. Is evolution always something that a group starts thinking about or do things go well for it so it starts to move up and then it gets the sense we can do new things? Well, I actually think that in very important cases, and the Islamic State is one of them, it does start out as a goal. It's, it, or at least it becomes a, a, a theoretical goal that is then materialized. Now, to look at that, let's look at Mao Zedong for a minute here. Mao Zedong had a theory of war, and this is, it comes out of the 1930s, his experience fighting both the nationalist Chinese and the Japanese. And he argues that you follow an evolutionary stage, set of stages. You begin with a political education. You have to win over the people. One of the statements about gorillas is they're the fish in the sea, and the sea are the people, and you've got to win them over. Once you get to that, you can enter the armed struggle and you enter as guerrillas. Small bands, still, they're big enough to, you know, enough uh, armament, do some real harm um, to, to an enemy. You start out as guerrillas, and it, as you gain in your numbers and your resources and get a little control over a, a larger population, you can start to create a few what look like pretty regular units, battalion size kind of units. And then they coordinate with the guerrillas, which is really interesting, because if you're going to fight a battalion, you want to concentrate. You find guerrillas, you want to disperse. And you can use the double threat to catch the enemy off. And that leads to victories that finally allow you to become a master of positional warfare. That's interesting, positional warfare. What do you mean? You can take and hold positions. You don't have to constantly be moving around, okay? That second stage of warfare, very interesting. Um, it's 
translated different ways, but most commonly it's called mobile warfare. And it applies, you've got regular units, but everything's got to keep moving. You can't take the enemy head on. You can't fight a great battle, okay? But at the top stage, you can. And by the way, if you read Mao or you read Che Guevara, they all insist you don't win until you get to that last stage. Now, however, coming out of, out of the Latin American experience, particularly Cuba, there was the notion that, wait a minute, we could start with really small groups, which they called foco, and if their ideas are called foquismo, and we could get this. Now what you're looking at is my modification of Mao Zedong's three stages of, of evolution. I've added a fourth. And it's based on, as I said, that this notion of that the Latin American revolutionaries felt that things were so bad, all you had, you didn't need to politically educate people. They already knew everything that was, you know, why they should overthrow the regime. But they thought it was impossible. The, it, the repression was so great. So the real education you had to give them was that you could turn to violence and survive. Okay? So you start that in this thing with the, the focal. Now, when people that we would call terrorists, like the Tupamaro of, of Uruguay, when they read that, they thought in terms of starting with a small, what we'd call terrorist group, which they often called urban guerrillas, okay? It's a whole thing about urban guerrillas, but, but what are urban guerrillas? They're basically terrorist groups, okay? And so the entry level to violence, to war, is no longer insurgency, it's now something less than insurgency. It's the FOCO, or for me, it's the terrorist cell. The terrorist cell to the guerrilla band, to the mixed regular forces, to a real army, okay? So that's there in revolutionary literature before the rise of the um, radical Islamists. Now, I said it's in, the, it's in the literature. Okay, yeah, it's in the, well, let's look at the evolution of that literature. Now I'd like you to look at this. Now, this is my illustration of the flow of military thought all the way from Clausewitz to al-Baghdadi. Okay? Now, that's going to come as a surprise to some people. Why? Well, I mean, Karl von Clausewitz is this classic Prussian military thinker, dies in 1831. He wrote the book On War, still probably the most read book about the theory and nature of warfare. And he did it for a European Christian audience. Okay? And one of his guiding principles is that war is an extension of politics. He said, you know, an extension of politics by other means. Okay. In other words, the decisions you make in a war have to advance the political cause. You can't just make them for reasons of military utility. They have to work into a greater cause. Okay. They have not to, to uh, make you weaker, but make you stronger. Okay. Guess what? If we look at it towards the other end of that spectrum, the guy next to El Baghdadi, that's Abu Bakr Naji, who wrote the key book for understanding radical Islamist military theory, The Management of Savagery. Okay? Now, in The Management of Sav Savagery, he uses the term politics, war is politics, sometimes on every page. He is quite literate about the notion that everything has to be guided by the long-term, greater goals. He is, in fact, echoing Clausewitz. Let's go over to the guy next to Clausewitz, 
Mao Zedong. Now, we've already learned about his three-stage evolution of revolutionary warfare. Guess what? If we look at Abu Bakr Naji, he has a three-stage evolution of warfare. Now, his is a little different. Now, his book is called The Management of Savagery, and that isn't about how you can be really savage against somebody. No. His book is about the middle phase of a three-phase evolution of warfare. The first involves attacks on uh, bad Muslim administrations, bad Muslim governments close to home. Um, you try to weaken them, overthrow them. At the very end, you're going to try to establish a new caliphate, a new greater Muslim state. But in between, there's a period of, of transition, which is going to be, chaos is probably too much of a word, but it's going to be disorganized. It's going to be a problem. And unless you handle it right, you won't end up where you want it to go, that middle period of savagery. So how do we manage that? That's what his thing is about. In fact, in terms of him having a three-stage evolution and beginning small and, get, and getting bigger, the noted scholar and commentator, William R. Polk, concludes the politico-military doctrine Naji lays out can be described as a Muslim version of what Mao Zedong and Ho Chi Minh proclaimed as their kind of war. In other words, he's saying it is essentially Mao translated into Arabic. Well, that's, that's a, a little much, but the point is you see what I'm saying. He is using Clausewitz. He is using Mao Zedong. Now, in between Mao and Naji, I've got a couple of, of less well-known uh, Islamist writers, Abu Ayyad al-Qurashi and Abdul al-Aziz Mulkin, and they were very close scholars of earlier classic military writings. And they didn't just write about it, and they footnoted it. They got really into it. And the, the indication would be that, that El Bakr Naji read their works and added his, his own bit to it. So he really is part of this evolution. To show you how close he sticks, and I'm here I'm talking about Naji, how close Naji sticks to what's happening in, the, in, in e even the West, he quotes Paul Kennedy. Now, Paul Kennedy is British born spent most of his career at Yale. He's a great historian of international relations. And his major book is called The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. And his explanation is, in their rise, in their coming to greater and greater power, these states create empires. They create something big. But that empire eventually is too much to handle. It's going to overmatch their resources. And they are going to decline because of what he calls imperial overstretch. Naji says it's time to rid ourselves of the American influence because they, in fact, are in this, in this stage of overstretch, of imperial overstretch. Now, if we go to the last figure there, we have Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of the Islamic State, the man who engineered that takeover of so much territory in, in, uh, in 2014 and ended up making this speech in the Mosul Mosque, which, by the way, is the photograph you're looking at. That's him at that Mosul Mosque uh, from, as it were, the, the, the podium uh, lecturing. At any rate, this guy is reputed to be a PhD. He is a scholarly kind of fellow. He is a reader as well as a doer. He is a smart, perhaps diabolically smart, but he is a smart strategist. And he achieved quite a bit. So we must recognize that these individuals in the, in the Islamist tradition of military thought really aren't coming out of nowhere. They are coming out of a tradition 
Even Naji says, read the classics of military thought, particularly those of revolutionary warfare, but correct them for their, their Sharia mistakes. In other words, adjust them to our ideals of radical Islam. So there you have it. Now, there's one other uh, thing I want to talk about in terms of strategies here. And that is when you deal with radical Islam, you get into this notion of global strategies and regional or national strategies. And one of the things that people often say is the Islamic State is interested in regional control and they're, they're not really global in their goals as opposed to what Al-Qaeda was. Well, I think you really got to finesse that. Okay, why do you need to finesse it? Because I think global strategies have two meanings, okay? The first one is global participation. Now that guy there, uh, Abdul uh, Youssef uh, Azam, he was a, actually a mentor of bin Laden. Um, and he and bin Laden coordinated in supporting the Afghans when they were fighting the Soviets, okay? And Azam believed in fighting a specific war in a specific place, but drawing globally on the people and resources to fight. He wrote a book called Join the Caravan. It's just perfect. The caravan, of course, is the violent war. But he's trying to get people from coming from afar to join the struggle in Afghanistan. So his, his vision was global for fighting a local war. If you look at bin Laden, bin Laden is, in fact, doing kind of the, a, a different thing. He's saying our real enemy is global, far away. Okay? The United States he makes a big deal of saying we can fight these corrupt, you know, Muslim regimes and create a new Muslim caliphate, but, you know, they're being supported by the U.S. and we, gotta, we have to defeat the U.S. enough to get them to essentially pull out of the Middle East. So his globalism was global conflict. That's a really important differentiation in those strategies. Okay. Well, let's get back to the, the much evolved uh, state of the Islamic State. That's it as its height, okay? That's a CNN map of it. It's at its height. Look at all the area that controls. Now, you can you'll see light, light color areas between the red ones. In most cases, though, it's uninhabited territory. Just if Roger, you know, the difference from one side to the other and from top to bottom, you've got a big state, a big area it controlled. And it clearly could engage in positional warfare. But it takes cities like Mosul, okay? It takes Fallujah. It takes Ramadi, okay? It almost takes Baghdad, in a sense. Certainly there was fear it was going to... Was that a group? Can you call that a group at that point? It's got 20, 30,000, you know, frontline warriors. And that brings you to the question of what is a state? A state's territory, a state's resources within that territory and others it can bring in, its forces, armed forces. You know, there's the old def definition of state is state is a monopoly of violence. I mean, it, all the instruments of violence really belong to the state in, in a true state, okay? The last one is the really conjectural one. You can argue that there's also a, a kind of civility that states are supposed to go along with. For example, the treatment of ambassadors and embassies. That's a fine example of sort of civility. Also, one of the mainstays of international law of war, the way you treat prisoners, you don't attack civilians, da 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 those really aren't enforced by an international agency. They're enforced by the desire of the state to be taken seriously as a state. What strikes me as a problem in the terrorist evolution, and particularly of, of ISIS, is they maintain a kind of terrorist sense of outrageous 
moral behavior even when they become a state. So they act like terrorists when they're a state. And that's one of the reasons people will make the mistake, well, that's a terrorist group because they're still beheading people. Well, yeah, but in the other terms, they're a state. Okay, now, so that's the, the diagram I've been showing you before, but that's not my real one, okay? We gotta add something. What happens when in evolution it becomes a state? According to my way of looking, it should be acting more like a state in the way it used violence. It should use, be using the violence mainly for fear and intimidation, and less for those other strategies as it becomes a state. That's a theory, okay? I'm surmising that. I think I see it, but ISIS and the Islamic State are a problem. But it's a, it's a kind of consequence of evolution. If you evolve into a state, then you're a state. You should be acting like one. But here's another thing. Evolution can go the other way. You can not just evolve. You can de-evolve. You can go down the the scale. That guy there, Abu Mahad al Adnani, was a spokesman for the Islamic State. He died, I think it was August of 2016, in an airstrike. But, but, he wrote his last major lecture presentation, piece of propaganda, whatever you call it, in May of 2006, uh, 2016, in May, dies in August, okay? Here it is. And he's already thinking what'll happen to, uh, to, to the Islamic State. Now, we can put that on the whole board so you can read it. And look at that. Or do you, O oh America, Consider defeat to be the loss of a city or a loss of land? Certainly not. We would be defeated, and you victorious, only if you were able to remove the Quran from the Muslims' hearts. We fight in obedience to Allah and to become closer to Him. And victory is that we live in the might of our religion or die upon it. It is the same whether... Allah blesses us with consolidation, or we move into the bare open desert, displaced and pursued. Think about that. Here is a set of four maps of the decline of the Islamic State, the de-evolving of them. Now, again, I'm going to put them on full screen just for, for a minute so you can understand the maps a little better. Look at January 2015. That's about as big as it ever got. By October of 2016, it has shrunk considerably. By July of 2017, it has lost Mosul, okay? It's no longer a threat to Baghdad. It's, it, um, and then by the time we get to March of 2019, it's like got a crossroads. It has shrunk to almost nothing. Now, a sign of that is this. That's Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in April of 2019. That's really interesting. We're used to seeing him in religious garb, at, you know, at that great speech he gave in J July of 2014 at Mosul. He's very religious. He's talking about all of, 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 of uh, Muslims coming and joining and being part of it. And there he is as a guerrilla leader, not as a head of a state. Look at the military vest. Look at the automatic weapon at his side. The black headdress is different. The, uh, ISIS tends to wear black headdresses, okay? He is now not trying to bring in everybody. He's trying to reassert and organize what's left to continue the fight. 
Evolution goes with de-evolution in this case, but it also can re-evolve. Re it's the notion that terrorism can go up and down that scale. What's next? Well, I don't deal with the future, I deal with the past. But I would say that terrorism is too easy. It requires very few resources, very little population, few members, and it's become, a, and this is a phrase I like, it's become part of the repertoire of violent political resistance. Enough people have done it that people know what can be done. And one of the lasting uh, influences of the Islamic State is that there was an Islamic State. That that was once achieved and could be achieved again. It one could evolve, okay? How can we work against terrorism? Well, as I've said, I believe we can combat terrorism by civic education by looking at that notion that, well, we can't stop the violence, but we can short-circuit it at the psychological impact. That requires what? Understanding, knowledge, and maybe even a little wisdom. And that's what I hope to teach. I hope to honor Jeremiah by compassion for the immediate victims of violence but remembering what the real threat is in terrorism and that it's a psychological impact. Have a sense of proportion about the danger and the response. Don't look at the awful things that the Islamic State is doing in the middle of 2015 in Syria and think that's going to happen in the United States. No way in the world that's going to happen in the United States. We're going to be dealing with small cells, lone wolves, that sort of thing. We're not going to have a, a radical transformation of Sharia law. People who want you to be afraid so you play their game in counterterrorism will overstate the threat. So we need to know what the threat is and keep it in proportion to other things. And we have to resolve that we will not become the allies of the terrorists by doing what they want us to do. The first question you should ask after a terrorist act is not, how can we get back at them? It's, what are they trying to get us to do? How, where's, where are they going to gain advantage by that act? and not become their allies. Well, Jeremiah, I've tried to do what you did. Tried to turn a academic field of knowledge into something of value in public policy. And in pursuing that goal, I feel I'm following the lead you've given me. So thank you very much, Jeremiah. And thank you for paying attention to all of this. Bye-bye.